All right, so I mean, yeah, we're only a bit late, so I'll just uh, I'll just start. So this is a bit of a different topic, and I want to do as usual. You guys know me, like let's let's have a back and forth. I don't think I do. I need this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like it, yeah, it's that's that's it's making me a bit uncomfortable. Uh, oh no, no, it's all right, it's all right. This, yeah, oh, it's also better. Okay, yeah, it's a bit better. It's a bit better. Anyway, anyway. Uh, okay, so what we're going to talk about is popular culture. So I just want to gauge your feelings at the beginning, because like I said, we're going to like, have a bit of a discussion. Um, as always, you like, feel free to disagree and push back and like, tell me what you think as we go. But if someone said to you um, something like this, right? You're a Christian, yeah? Uh, most, like 99, 95% of the things that you watch and read and listen to, the music and books and TV shows and everything, are produced by people who are not Christian who don't know Christ, right? So Christ is the truth. Those people don't have the truth. You shouldn't watch and listen and read to those things. It's dangerous. Like you have all the truth that you need in the church and the Bible and the church fathers, etc. Why are you watching Netflix and Peppa Pig and whatever it is that you watch? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Like that's I'm like same, same. We kind of all grew up with it. So it's not that far-fetched. But we've obviously changed a lot. I mean, ha put your hands up if you've watched Netflix in the last seven days. Yeah, or listened to a song that wasn't produced by like a Christian band or something, right? That's, I mean, that's kind of why this topic is a bit different. It's a bit unusual. Um, but we do it anyway, right? Like everyone is already watching and listening to things that are produced by non-Christians. So we might as well think about it. So how would you respond? Rose, what would you say now? I would say that you don't have to only expose yourself to Christian things, but you can find Christian things in anything. Like in the Tessonians when we used to do the little hangout and we go over there, we would have like time where we were asked to contemplate about something that we were doing. So for example, if we were all having koshery, we all had to contemplate and try and find Christ in the koshery. So someone would say, oh, the, the onions, they have to be put in really hot oil and almost burnt to a crisp to add this beautiful texture that without it wouldn't really make the dish as nice. So you don't really necessarily have to be exposed to non-Christian values, but you can find Christ in almost anything. Wow, okay, that's a really good illustration. All right, so the point is that even though these things aren't Christian, produced for a Christian purpose, if you can find Christ in like onions on koshery, you can find him in the songs that you listen to and everything. Okay, so that's a good point. So even though they're not produced by Christian people, they're still like true and valuable things in them, is what you're saying, basically. All right. Anybody else have any other thoughts on that feeling? Question is, someone comes to you and says, everything that is produced, so all your popular culture, TV and movies and everything, is produced by people who aren't Christian and who don't have the truth of Christ, so you shouldn't watch and listen and read those things. They're all, all they can do is corrupt you, right? Um, I think personally, like for example, whether it be music, whether it be a movie, that is a gift that is given from God, that's a talent, and yeah, it might not be directly used to glorify Him, but I guess it's, you go back to the whole talents, like God's given you this gift, and there's nothing wrong with enjoying someone's gifts. Okay, so you're saying that in a sense, even though the person who produced the thing wasn't Christian, that thing still comes from God in a way, right? Not directly, but like the person was made by God and their talents are made by God. So in some way, accidentally, that thing still reflects something that's true about God. It's all right? Yeah. Okay, that's a really good answer. Yeah, that's good. It's good. Uh, okay. Yeah, good, good. So that's a good like, yeah, I just wanted to see if you, if you felt that way already. Um, basically, when I'm talking about popular culture, anything that is produced by a non-Christian, right? Um, anything that's produced by a like, secular, non-Christian culture around us. All the books, all the movies, all the TV shows, all the songs. Even people like Jordan Peterson kind of counts. I know he's sort of like in a weird, like maybe he's a Christian, maybe he's not, but like 
he's like he's mainly not a Christian. He's a psychologist, right? All of these things that we have, um, think of it this way, right? You spend like one day a week, roughly, at church if you add up all the hours. Uh, one waking day at church. The rest of the week you spend out in the world hearing and listening and speaking and thinking about things that are coming from the rest of the world. Um, So what we want to do today is think about this, right? As a Christian, what should my attitude be when I'm engaging with all of these non-Christian things? How do I approach them? And the reason this is, like I said, this is a bit, it's an unusual topic, not something we speak about often. The reason why you would want to think about this, both for yourself and if you are a servant or becoming a servant, the reason why I think this is important is one of the big challenges for all of us, especially as people who serve youth or have friends that we're trying to like get closer to Christ, is that we live our life in segments, right? If you think of your life as a pie, the way that we like to naturally think about it is I've got like one slice of the pie for God, and then I have a slice for work and a slice for social And all of these are nice and separate, right? Like I give God what he needs on Sunday and I pay my tithes and I serve in Sunday school or whatever. But then the rest of my life is my life, yeah? And the problem with that is you end up not really being a Christian all the way through. You become like someone who ticks boxes, but your Christianity is kind of surface level, right? It only touches that little piece that you've cut out for God artificially separated from the rest of your life. One of my friends put it really nicely. It stuck with me. He's like, we don't want you to give God like a slice of the pie. We want him to be the filling that is in all the slices of the pie. Right? He's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah no, I congratulate him on it every time I see him. Well done, Paul. Um, so Christ is, point being, even when you sit and watch a movie or listen to a song, like a non-Christian movie, non-Christian song, something that's got nothing to do explicitly with Christ, If you're truly a Christian, even that has some sort of spiritual value, right? God is with you in everything that you do. You know, St. Paul says, pray always. How can you pray always, for example, when you're watching TV, listening to Jordan Peterson or something like that? That's kind of what we're talking about, right? So this is a way of, think of it as, this is a way of helping us to kind of make our Christianity not so surface level, but help it to penetrate the other parts of our lives. Does that make sense? Okay, so there's three strategies, right? And I'm just going to give you like... Hopefully, I sent, um, did the document I sent in the Malak Youth Group come through? Was there an attachment? So we may, if we have time, hopefully we can, um, like I'll give that to you guys and you can just discuss it with the persons next to you. Um, uh, um, okay, so I'm going to first give you like the theory, right? How do we, how should we think about it? I'm going to give you three different strategies that Christians often have for how we should engage with popular culture. And then hopefully with time, we'll do one example. So the three different strategies that you may have encountered are these, right? I think there might be more, but these are the three we're going to talk about. The first one is the one that I put to you as a thought experiment at the beginning, right? Which I'm just calling disengagement. In other words, you're a Christian. That stuff's not Christian. Don't touch it. Don't listen to it. Don't do anything with it, right? Um, It is a bit culty, right? And you get a bit, you know, and almost always, I think we sort of know from experience, that backfires, right? Because what's the first thing your kid does when you say don't touch that? They want to touch it, right? So... And yeah, it is a thing that coercive controlling religions often use. Um, Yeah, yeah. let's leave that alone. Uh, Okay, so that's that's one solution. Obviously, I don't think any of us here actually live by that, right? If that's what we're doing, we've all failed completely because all of us listen to and read and watch things that aren't Christian. Um, Second option, and this one kind of can go along with the third one, but I like the third one best, is to build an alternative popular culture. So what I mean with that is... Um, Okay, that's an example from the early church. So, mind you, all these three options are kind of in the early church. There were people in the early church who said, don't read anything from pagans. Um, So that was an example of that there. The other option, second option, is let's build our own popular culture so that we don't have to use all of the heathen stuff, right? Instead of Netflix, let's make a Christian streaming service. Instead of Channel 7, let's have Rappi TV. Instead of Tupac, let's have Lecrae. Do you guys know Lecrae? So the whole like contemporary Christian music scene is like, I mean, that's not the only reason it started, but one of the reasons was we don't want kids to listen to rock music, so let's make Christian rock music, right? And so there are like Christian heavy metal bands. Some of them, I, like, I'm, not, I'm not knocking this view, uh, like this, this practice, because some of them are really good. Uh, has anyone seen Man of God, the, um, the movie about St. Nectarius of Aegina? It's still, like, it's actually quite hard to watch because it's a very limited release. Exodus just did one a few parishes, I think you should definitely do a movie night where you, you have to sort of pay and watch it. It's very well made. 
Um, so the point is, there are some Christian movies that I really, really like. But often there are, like, also, these are very low quality, like, it's really just a matter of, like, oh, let's, let's make something that sounds like the secular stuff so we can stop our kids from listening to it. Best example of this, I can't believe I didn't put it on here, but you remember Doom, the fir- like, one of the very early first-person shooters, very, very violent, like in pixels, but it came out in, like, 1990-something, yeah. and everyone was playing with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then all the Christians were really worried because it was very, like, very, very popular, but it was, like, set in hell and you're shooting demons and it's really violent, as violent as you can be with, like, 64-bit pixels on a, on a PC that barely has color. And so they made a, another version. I actually have it installed on my, because I used to play it as a kid. It was called Super 3D Noah's Ark, right? It was a first-person shooter where you run around the ark and you have to throw food at animals to make them go to sleep. So you have like different, you have like a crossbow that shoots like little pellets, and then you have like a machine gun that shoots like apples at the monkey, and like, and there's a boss on each level. Huh? Uh, bread? I can't remember. I, can't, I haven't played it in a while. Um, so that, that's a really good example, right? Let's just take exactly the secular stuff and just like give it a Christian coat of paint, and then we've solved the problem. So you know, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, I think it's a good strategy. Like, obviously, there's good role for Christians who are creative to do stuff that reflects their faith. But it doesn't solve the problem, right? Because you're not going to be able to live off that. We can't build a wholly, completely different culture. And would we really want to, right? If we're not monks who are living in the desert and we're actually in the world dealing with people who don't share our faith, don't we want to be able to kind of share their life and their culture to some extent so that we actually have something to uh, communicate with them about? So the third option, which is the one I think should be like the foundation, is what I'm calling like the mature approach. The reason I'm calling it the mature approach is because it takes a bit more effort, it takes a bit more wisdom and maturity. Um, It's a little bit more risky than the other two. The other two are nice and safe. This one is a bit more, takes some like, you have to be wise, right? You have to do it with discernment. Uh, But it's also, because it's the mature approach, it's the one that yields the most benefits, right? And so to introduce it, Uh, I'm not making it up. It's what I think is the majority view among the church fathers. How can I say that? Because the church fathers didn't have Netflix and Tupac and Peppa Pig and Jordan Peterson to deal with. What they did have to deal with, they did have a culture that wasn't Christian around them, that was still the majority culture, which was pagan culture, right? Um, Have anyone read Percy Jackson or seen the movies? Yeah, so like, you know, Zeus and Hera and... Poseidon, all of that. That was an actual religion. That was the major religion, like the pagan religion. So all the emperors that persecuted the Christians, that was their religion. Um, All of those gods with different names in different places and so on. And they had stories and legends and myths and so on. And they had book versions. There were play versions. There were popular songs based on that religion. That was the popular religious culture of the other time. So it wasn't just another culture. It was actually another religion. These were, like, this is the religion of the idols that we always hear about in the time of the early church. So the church fathers, and mind you, just like in Egypt, if you go to school, you have to learn the Quran. In, like, education, even after the empire became Christian, the church fathers, they learned all of these texts in school. They studied Plato and Aristotle and Homer and all the, like, the, um, the pagan myths and poems and so on. So there's all these stories all these works of pagan mythology and religion, what did the church fathers say when they were dealing with this question? How did they, as Christians who don't accept this religion, how do they deal with these stories and so on? Uh, So I'm going to read you like a slightly long quote. This is on the the Word document. Uh, If you want to follow along, it is um, on page... Actually, I don't have pages, but it's quote uh, F... On the, uh, oh, sorry, quote G on the handout, just above the table. Uh, so he said, so this is actually, he wrote this little essay, and the title of the essay is An Address to Young Men on the Right Use of Greek Literature. In other words, this is a how to manual on if you're a young Christian man, because only men studied in those days, how do you study or how do you read this pagan literature? Uh, and his basic, it's all summed up in this one like metaphor, right? So I'll read it to you and then ask you to tell me what you think he's saying. Just as bees know how to extract honey from flowers, even so here also those who look for something more than pleasure and enjoyment in the pagan poets may derive profit for their souls. After the manner of bees, we must use these writings. For the bees do not visit all the flowers without discrimination, 
but rather having taken what is adapted to their needs, they let the rest go. And so we, if wise, shall take from the heathen books whatever is appropriate for us and is allied to the truth and shall pass over the rest. Could someone just like re-summarize that, regurgitate it in your own words? What's he saying? What does a bee do that we've got to do? Bees go around taking what they need and then they like ditch the rest. So we should read everything and yeah. kind of expose ourselves to everything, take what we need and then leave whatever exactly. we don't need. Exactly. Yeah. A bee knows how to, t I mean, I don't know how it works exactly, but bee goes and takes the bit of the flower that it needs. Whatever is not helpful for building the beehive, it leaves behind. And so he's saying in exactly the same way, that's got to be your attitude to all of this pagan literature. You come, you take what's good, what's appropriate for you, and you leave the rest. Uh, and notice one important thing here is uh, also here those who look for something more than pleasure and enjoyment. This is a really important point, right? You're only going to be able to get this kind of profit that he's talking about out of these pagan texts if you're not doing it just for pleasure and enjoyment. He's actually saying the equivalent for us would be when you're watching something or listening to something or thinking about something, reading something, we shouldn't just be doing it for pleasure, right? We should always be Maybe you can take a break every now and then. It doesn't have to be like an English class all the time. But we should be thinking about what we're reading and consuming. Uh, more than just for pleasure and enjoyment, we should be looking for the truth in it as well. Okay, so why does he, like, this assumes that there's something good to be gotten out of these texts, even though, like I said, they're pagan, right? They're inspired by uh, false religion. Why is there something, why is St. Basil saying you take the good? Like, what is the good to be gotten out of, these, out of these texts? So he's working on the assumption, I'm drawing on a few different church fathers here, because like I said, this is a very widespread view. A lot of them wrestled with this problem. Uh, all of this rests on the assumption that, it's really simple actually, right? There's God, and he made human beings. He didn't just make Christian human beings, he made all human beings. So even the pagans who wrote these poems and works... They have the image of God in them, and the God in whose image they're made is the same God that we worship, is Christ. Yeah? That's not something you can change by converting to a different religion. It's something that's like built into the actual structure of every human soul. And so, just like you were saying, Philo, right? Like you're saying, because everyone's gifts come from God, everyone, no matter who they are, when they produce something, something of God is reflected in that, right? It might be really twisted, but there's still something basically good at the bottom of it. And so that's basically where they're coming from, right? You can see in everything, no matter what culture it's produced from, no matter how much you might hate what they stand for in other respects, there's something in there that reflects the image of God. Obviously, more so in some things than others. You have to use, again, discernment. Um, I can skip those, because here's a really helpful metaphor. This one's from St. Clement of Alexandria, who is a very important saint in our church, because he's just one, or he's just two generations after the apostles, and he's one of the very early teachers of the school of Alexandria, which we're very proud of in the, in the Coptic church. So he has this really beautiful metaphor, because he was someone who used, he was a very, very well-educated man. He studied Greek philosophy. He actually was a Greek philosopher, a pagan, and then he converted to Christianity when he was an adult. And when he became a church father and a teacher and theologian in the early church, this is in like 150 AD or so, um, he was criticized because his Christian writings used lots of pagan philosophy and poems and things. He would quote the Bible and he would say, and also Homer says this alongside St. Paul and so on. And so he was criticized. There were lots of people who were like, just use the Bible, right? What's, why do you need to keep bringing in these heathen pagans? And so one of the books that he wrote was a kind of defense for why he was using these non-Christian texts. And so, again, I'll read this passage out and you tell me what you think he's saying. He has this beautiful metaphor, right? He says, Greek culture and philosophy itself are shown to have come down from God to men, not with a definite direction, but in the way in which showers fall down on the good land and on the dunghill. For there is only one farmer of the soil, which is within human beings. He who from the beginning has sowed nutritious seeds is the most important part. He who in each age rained down the Lord, the word. But the times and places which received it created the differences which exist. So the metaphor is there's God up there and he's raining down the Lord, the Word. Who's the Lord, the Word? We know him by another name. It's Jesus. It's Jesus, right? He's raining down Jesus throughout all times and places. 
and different plants, just like as in nature, the rain falls, the same rain falls everywhere, but then different plants grow up in different places. He actually, I've cut it out here because I couldn't fit it, but he talks about the parable of the sower, right? The sower throws the same seeds, and then depending on the land in which it, if it's rocky or thorny or shallow or deep or whatever, different plants grow up. And he's basically saying that God is raining down his influence always, and depending on the reception that it had, different culture, different things grew up. So sometimes you get like really sad, piddly, tiny shrubs that grow up, but they're still trees. Sometimes you get slightly bigger things. And his basic point is that Greek philosophy is really, really good. Like it's a tree that grew up and had pretty deep roots. It gets a lot of things right. It doesn't get it perfectly right. It's not, you know, it's still a different religion. It's still polytheist and they don't know anything about Jesus and so on. But a lot of the things that it talks about are really good. So he's always quoting about how they talk about virtue. And the Greeks were very big about controlling the body, not letting your desires rule the body. Um, many other things that you can look at as a Christian and say, yeah, that's really good. That's, they got that, obviously, from Christ himself, right? They were inspired by the truth of Christ that's in the human person. Um, and so that's that rain that's falling into every human soul being expressed in their culture. And then the best tree, of course, is the one that falls in Israel. That's, the God that, that's where God is speaking himself. In the other places, it's kind of, you know, that, that's the part where he says at the beginning, not with a definite direction, right? In Israel, God comes down and speaks through Moses, speaks through Isaiah, etc. He founds Israel himself, and obviously in Jesus, he himself is speaking. So that's the ultimate, that's the truth with a capital T. And everywhere else, it's the same word, the same God who is speaking, but it's kind of like, sort of, you know, this bit this way, a bit that way, it's kind of getting lost in translation, yeah? Uh, but the point is that everything that they say, which is true in those other cultures, if you're a Christian, there's only one truth, right? The, that's where he says, there's only one farmer of the soil. There's only one source of all of these things. It's God, right? The only, uh, the, what the demon's job is and what they're trying to do when they're twisting all of these things is all they're trying to do is distort what God has revealed, right? But they can't make up anything new in and of themselves. Uh, okay, and so obviously, these other cultures, they're reflections of the truth, but they're not like the truth with a capital T, like I was saying. So he also says, someone talking about truth, and then truth, capital T, giving an account of herself, are very different. The first is a shot at the truth, the second is the truth. The first is a representation, the second is the reality. So you can think of it as like the difference between you know, a drawing of people and an actual person. There's a resemblance between the two, but one is like real, the other one is sort of, yeah, there's a resemblance. But the point is there's still an affinity, there's still a connection between the two. So all of that is the foundation for why when you go to things that are produced by non-Christians, there is genuine Christian truth to be found in those things, yeah? Does that make sense? Image of God, God's revealing himself to all peoples, all nations, all religions. Not everything that people say who aren't Christian is false, obviously, right? A lot of it is true coming from uh, Christ himself. Because it's only a shadow, like, obviously, the, your foundation, if you want to know who God is, you come to Christ. If you want to have, like, the, the foundation for your life, you come to Christ for that. But this is why you can look for the good things and the true things outside of that. So is that all good? Does anyone have any questions or clarifications? Everyone on the same page? Yeah? Here's the thing. Um, I like how you said you can find like Christ in everything and there are some things that are like Christ is there but it's a bit distorted, right? Mm -hmm. But that's where we're going to use our discernment. It's not like we can say, well, Sam said there's Christ in everything, so I'm going to like watch yes. anything I want yeah. and like go to anywhere I want to go and participate in anything I want to participate because I can find Christ in everything. That's not what we're saying, right? That's a very good point. Actually, I'm glad you said that. I, should, I feel I should have actually, now that I think of it, I should have made that point clearer. I'm kind of assuming that you guys all know. Yeah, because you could take this argument and you could twist it terribly. Yeah. Like, I went to a strip club because God is there, you know? God is of there. Course. I, I, he's like, in the these yeah, beautiful yeah. people. God made these drugs for me, or like what? I, like you know, yeah. You can you can yeah. twist it, right? Marijuana you can, is from the earth. It's yeah, from yeah. <laughs> you can see all the ways in which you could take this and use it to kind of do things that you know are kind of not good for you. Yeah. Um, but the point would be, even that, like this, those examples don't disprove the principle, right? Because it actually is true. Everything, you know, that you, I'm sure you've you've come across the idea, but you know, like good is a real thing, and evil is not an actual substance, it's the, it's the absence of good, right? In the same way that light is like actually made of photons, there's no such thing as like a dark particle, 
Darkness is just the absence of light. So all of those things are really evil only because there's a tiny bit of good that's lacking all the other goods that are necessary to come along with it. So, you know, you can, you can see that, like, it's usually a kind of pleasure that's been separated from all the other things that come and, like, make it a holistic experience, yeah? yeah. So, so it's still true, kind of, but, yeah. Yeah, like, focusing on is, like, the streamlined pop culture type of stuff that you can run into any day. Like, if you, in yourself as a Christian, know, you know within your heart, you can't trick anyone. You're only really trying to trick yourself, mm. whether you're saying, like, I'm going to do this because it's, God's in there. Yes, yes, that's right. That's why I was saying this is the mature approach, right? Which means it's a bit more risky. You have to be mature enough to actually, like, know what you're doing and be brave. Sorry, Jerome had his hand up first, and then we can come back to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've actually always struggled with this. um, Because, like, um, I'm on the fence now, to be honest with you. But I've always heard, I've I've always liked this concept because... Um, what it does is it makes you more relatable to the culture. Um, for example, uh, Golgotha, that's originally, a, I don't know if I want to call it pagan, but it was originally something that was within the culture and we changed the tune to be Christian. Um, and I also like, uh, for example, Plato's writings. I like played, um, the Allegra, Allegora, I'm not too sure how it's pronounced. But, um, and I feel like that is a very... Um, good way of explaining reality and so forth. Um, But then again, I go and see Christ. And I don't know if this is exactly a good counter-argument with it, but when he rebukes the devil saying, you are the Christ, the Son of God, and it's like, I'm not accepting the truth from evil. I'm not going to accept the truth. Even though you are saying the truth, it's coming from a source that is not godly. And so I've always been on the fence with that. Maybe I'm taking it wrong. Maybe it's just that Christ didn't want people to know that he was the Christ Son of God. But if assuming, oh, I'm not too sure. I can't say assuming, but whatever Christ meant, if it does mean in that context, not accepting evil, even though it's the truth, how do we navigate that with relating to the culture? Because then again, like as I said, it is important to be relative to the culture. As Paul says, be a Greek to the Greek, uh, Greeks, be a Jew to the Jews, be a Gentile to the Gentiles. Um, so, yeah, I do struggle with it. Is there a line um, with this? Yeah, that's a really good point. Does anyone have any thoughts? Do you want to respond to that? I don't think he said to be, be a, he said, I have become um, a Greek to the Greek. Or a, so he, he knows who he is. He knows his, his core is, is at a good place. He understands truth, you know, understands Christ. So he takes that. And, and becomes able to relate, makes the message relatable to the people that he's speaking with. So it's not, it's not the other way around. It's not saying that you should become a Greek to the Greek and taking what is Hebrew or Greek, whatever it is, and take that upon yourself. That's not what he's saying. It's the other way around. He's, he's making the message that Christ brought to the world and making it relatable to the experience that's around him. I think that's where it is. Notice that if I could just jump back to one of the quotes that I saw. No, I think I took it out. Yeah, I, okay, I have it here off the slide, but let me just read it out to you. This, so this is St. Justin Martyr. He said, Whatever things were rightly said among all men belong to us Christians. For all the writers were able to see realities darkly through the sowing of the implanted word that was in them. Uh, there was a stronger one somewhere, but I think I've, I've lost it. Basically, what he says, he talks about Socrates and Plato specifically, and he says when they were saying true things, it was Christ speaking through them. Because there's only one truth, right? You can't say it's, it's tr- like it's a, you know, the devil's made another kind of truth. So the point would be that it's not actually someone else speaking. What you're doing when you're going to these cultures and finding what works with you, what you're doing is you're actually finding Christ who's already there. You're not working with a, a false power. Um, you're actually, yeah, it's, so it's, it's something that belongs within the faith. Mm. Uh, we need to sort of like try to, Dig in and uh, um, clarify what you mean by truth, literal truth and mm. capital truth. So there's information in other people's cultures, I mean religions particularly, mm. that is assumed to be truth, but it's not truth. For, for example, in Islam, it says that if a woman is disobedient, mm. apparently God said that if she's disobedient, that you set her to beds apart, no relationship with her. If she's still naughty, then you are take the next step of you can hit her mm. because she's, she's done that. 
So th presumably this is God saying this. This is information mm. coming mm. from God. So that data, we can't say it's truth. No, right? no, 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 no. Yeah. Right? So this applies yeah. to the things that are true in, the, in that culture. Exactly. So that's yeah. something, yeah, but so obviously the, it's so mixed the, with lies as well. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. what you said earlier is important. The, the, the ability to discern what is truth or mm. not truth, I think is the, the, the issue because yeah. if you don't have that strength and, and wisdom or even to ask and communicate with people around you, um, you can take something that is not true and say, it's truth, God said. No, you can, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's why this is, again, this is the dangerous approach. Yeah. But like I'm saying, because we do it anyway, because you're dealing with all of this culture anyway, I think instead of being afraid, we should learn to use discernment. Um, otherwise, like if you're gonna commit to the, I don't wanna like risk it, then do one of the other two, right? Only watch Christian stuff. But if we're actually going to continue to engage with the culture, we have to start to develop discernment. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, I think I feel like... Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, those other approaches that you mentioned, right? Mm. The one where you're like, no, I will not go there and, uh, and, and changing up popular culture to, to suit what we are. Yeah, the first to disengagement mm -hmm. and build. Do you, do you feel that those approaches sort of um, have others resent Christians? Um, they're put off Christians because of they see us as righteous or self-righteous or? I, th I think so. And to be honest, there's one of the quotes that's on the um, handout that I don't have on the PowerPoint, but it's the, it's the one that's numbered E by uh, St. Gregory the Theologian, where he actually kind of tells Christians off for how bad a reputation they've given our religion because they're so ignorant of everything else that's not within their religion. So it's true, it's like Jerome was saying, part of the reason that we do this is because we need to actually be relatable to some extent. No one's gonna take you seriously if you've only, like you can't have a conversation with someone who has a whole different culture to you and you've never even considered it before. You don't know what they believe, what they think, why they think it. Um, if you're that closed, there's actually no, it's the opposite of what Jesus did and what Paul did, right? They found, uh, I'll give you an example in a second, but they knew the culture of the people they were talking to and they were able to kind of find that and, and use it. So yeah, and it's also, I mean, it's also, I feel like part of our, if we genuinely think that we have the truth, we shouldn't be afraid to look at the other options, right? You know, like, are you afraid you're gonna find out that we're wrong? If you think, you know, yeah. So it's important to actually like, yeah, be a bit more, uh, yeah, so I think you're right. I think that is part of the reason. We can't have an effective witness to the world outside of us if we're stuck in our own, um, our own bubble. But again, has to be done with discernment. It's not a, not a free-for-all. Uh, okay, let me just push on, see if this deals with anything. Um, all right, why would you... Okay, so basically what I've established so far, all I'm saying is, Church Fathers said you should and can and should look for the truth that is in these other things, um, even though it's only a shadow and a reflection and a sort of like, you know, 50% of the truth. The question is, why bother, right? If you have 100% of the truth in Christ, why would you bother looking in these other places? So I've kind of distilled from their writings three reasons um, that like stick out to me. One, because it's good practice for learning moral lessons, looking at a moral situation and picking out what's good and what's bad. Um, that point's kind of self-explanatory, so I'll, I'll skip it. Um, okay. This one is the one that we've been talking about already, but this is actually really important for developing the skill of discernment. We keep talking about how necessary discernment and maturity is in order to be able to do this well. How do you actually get that? Part of it is like any other skill or muscle in your body, you have to use it, right? You gotta use it to actually build it up and build its strength. So what St. Basil says, if there is a similarity between the Bible and the pagan works, we've established that there is, right? There's some true things in them, then a knowledge of pagan works will be useful to us in our search for truth. When they say true things, that's good. We've learned something that's true. Excellent. If not, if the things that they're saying are false, because like the example that Abuna gave, there's lies and truth mixed in together, then the comparison by emphasizing the contrast will be of no small service in strengthening our regard for the better one. Did you follow that? It's worded a bit complexly saying there's two options when you read something from a, a pagan author. Either what they're saying is true, in which case, great, you've learned something true, or it's false, in which case, the fact that you have identified its falsehood 
has better equipped you to recognize the truth from the falsehood. You can see why the truth next to the falsehood is false, right? It's the difference between telling someone who has a different religion to you, no, no, that's wrong because I don't believe it, and saying, no, no, that's wrong because, you know, to use the example that Abuna gave, right, you can appeal to other principles, you know, like, isn't God... Sorry, yeah. You can kind of appeal to things within, things that they already believe, their humanity, other aspects of their religion, for example, and say, doesn't this wrong thing contradict these other principles? Um, and in that way, you're not just kind of like coming in from the outside and attacking. You're showing them based on things that they already accept, based on principles that they already accept, which is much more effective. And for us, it strengthens our grasp of the truth as well. Uh, with that... I don't think it works. Uh, with that in mind, it's working. You oh, can hear. Yeah. Um, I've always struggled when reading something that might not necessarily uh, be in line with my belief. I've always struggled to approach it in an unbiased manner. Mm -hmm. I always go in with these preconceived ideas that, look, this is wrong. And it's sort of like I, like I told myself that I'm open to being convinced mm -hmm. otherwise, but at the same time, subconsciously, I'm... Like, that is that bias. How do you, like... Yeah, that's a hard question. Honestly, I think there's an extent to it. Like, there is no such thing as an unbiased person. You can sort of do things that... I, would, I think of it as a kind of calibration, right? If you have a measuring instrument, you do things to calibrate it, to test how, um, how accurate it's being. So there are things that you can do, like... Yeah, I mean, that's a whole other topic. Like, just critical thinking, right? Critical thinking exercises you can use to determine how objective you're being in a situation. But I think we all have to own our bias. That's part of being intellectually honest. Um, same with, you know, whether you have a religion or whether you're an atheist or belong to another religion or whatever. Everyone kind of comes with pre-assumptions. Um, but I think it's more a matter of being aware of them and kind of, like, owning up to them. Yeah, I feel like, yeah, that's a whole other area. But there's, yeah, I mean, yeah it's worth, worth talking and thinking about. Uh, okay, so that's one thing, build up discernment, like through practice. And then the last one mentioned by a few of you, this translation says expert, but um, the, I think the original word is like just a knowledgeable person, um, a knowledgeable Christian, a Christian basically who can speak to others who have different points of view. He says the expert is the one who brings everything to bear on the truth. He takes whatever is useful from mathematics, from the fine arts, from literary studies, and of course philosophy, and protects the faith from all attacks. Um, and then in our more recent times, Amber Gregorius, who passed away in, I think, 2001, is a very underappreciated uh, figure in our church, but he wrote a beautiful little article. Um, the title of the article was, Men of Religion or Religious Men Should Study Philosophy, because he studied philosophy. And he says, a religious man who is knowledgeable in the sciences of his age is better equipped to convey his ideas and doctrines, uh, the doctrines of religion to people's minds in a manner that is relevant to their way of thinking and their feelings. For this reason, a religious man ought to exert the utmost effort to broaden his mind with all culture and science of his age, for this will serve as a valuable tool in successfully accomplishing his mission among the people. All right. So, yeah, same principle, but in order to reach other people who don't share our basic principles, this is a, a valuable thing. All right, all good. Those, those three reasons. Any other thoughts on that? Almost done now. Okay. So, where is all this coming from? I know we haven't actually talked about any actual like pop culture yet or hero's journey, so I'm going to try and squeeze that in. One really important example, like where are the church fathers themselves getting them from? Because this is the apostles fast, it's important to acknowledge, this is a biblical principle, right? It comes from, uh, in many places, Paul quotes non-Christian authors. One of the most important ones is Acts 17. So in Acts 17, has anyone here been to Greece? You guys have. Did you go to the, um, uh, what's it called, uh, the Areopagus, the, the place where he spoke to the, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you were, you, you were there when this actually happened, like, oh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so you all know this, hopefully you've heard this story before, right? Paul's traveling through Athens. So this is a place where there are very, very few Jews. Almost all of the people here believe in the religion of Zeus and Hercules, etc. Um, and he stands up, as he often does, Paul, is a very good public speaker, and he gives this amazing speech to all of these pagan Greeks. Um, one of the really important things to note about this is in every other speech that he gives where he's talking to Jewish people, every second line he's quoting the Old Testament, 
because that's their scripture, right? He's speaking to them in their language. This is one of the only places where Paul goes for like 20 verses and he doesn't quote a single thing from the Old Testament. Everything he's saying is from the Old Testament, but he doesn't quote it once. What he does do is he quotes two hymns to Zeus, two hymns that were sung in a religious context to Zeus, the guy with the thunderbolts. The passage where he does it is here, right? So I'll read that passage and then I'll show you where the two quotes actually come from. Uh, He says to them, and he has made from one blood, God has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. The hint there is when he says, as some of your own poets have said. So nowadays, because we live in the age of Google, you can just Google Acts 17 and Wikipedia will show you the original, like where he's pulled out those two quotes. They're really interesting, very fascinating. The first one, uh, it's one of my favorite verses, in him we live and move and have our being. The full context is this, the verse of the hymn, again to Zeus, they fashioned a tomb for you, Zeus, holy and high one, but you are not dead, you live and abide forever, for in you we live and move and have our being. Isn't that interesting? Why are they talking about Zeus being in a tomb? Like, it's very, it's very interesting. I mean, yeah, it's a whole other story. Um, but it's just very interesting, right, that Paul saw that, and obviously something clicked in him. He's like, whoa, this sounds, this sounds familiar to me. I went, right, and he might have been a little bit divine. He might also live and abide forever. Um, yeah, 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 it's very, yeah, we'll talk about that for ages. Um, and, yeah, the other one I'm skipping just for sake of time. Okay, so this is a good part to wrap up this theoretical bit, right? So, uh, Amber Samuil, another very underappreciated guy. So he, this, he's the one who was um, unfortunately killed in 1981 when uh, President Sadat was assassinated. He was sitting like a couple of chairs behind him and unfortunately he got caught in the crossfire. But he wrote a beautiful book on individual service, basically how do you as a servant reach out to individual people. And he has a long chapter, very, very nice, about how important it is not to come in with a preconceived judgment of a person. So that you're kind of like, I want you to be this way, and I'm gonna force you into this mold. It's very important that we kind of work with people where they are, help them to flourish rather than like squeeze them. And so he reads this story from Acts 17 that I just read to you, and he says, St. Paul avoided preconceived judgments against the people, and then spoke to them without bias, which was not only a wise and good way to begin, but true love flowing from the depths of the heart of Paul, a man who had put off all arrogance and any thought of seeing himself as better than others. Instead, he sees them as better than himself, as people searching for God whose only problem is that they do not know how to reach him. Thus, it becomes his main concern to humbly give direction to their great religiosity. It's really nice. So this is an expression of love, right? That's the other main reason to do this, because it's a Christ-like thing to do. It's incarnational, right? It's becoming all things to all men. All right, so I don't, hopefully I don't need to sum up, right? There's um, seeds or shadows of the truth in every work because all human beings are in the image of God. There's one word, all truth is Christian truth, if Christ is actually the truth with a capital T. Um, so even though your main foundation is Christ himself, you can recognize Christ all over the place because he's not limited to the four walls of the church. And in doing that, there are all these benefits for us as Christians. We relate better to others. We get discernment. We sort of practice using our mental skills and et cetera, et cetera. That's really the whole, the whole, like, that's the basis for how, like, the basic ground rules for how we should engage with popular culture, what I'm suggesting. All good? All right, so let's finish then. I'll do this in, like, five minutes so that we can finish exactly on time with an example of how you would do this with popular culture. Um, so I'm inspired here by lots of, this stuff was actually really, like, beneficial to me. Um, I still listen to a lot of it. If you go on to Ancient Faith Radio and you type like Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings or um, take your pick, you will find a bunch of podcasts on virtually every thing. And it'll be an Orthodox priest or a theologian or someone, like someone whose like, main day job is to teach at an Orthodox theological college. And they've come to this thing and they're speaking about Harry Potter. They're speaking about Lord of the Rings, whatever. Um, uh, I've given you a few examples there. I can send you links if you want to the actual podcasts. Um, and they actually have, so most of those talks are recorded from uh, an event which they hold every year called Doxicon. You know Comic-Con? 
it's the orthodox version of Comic Con. Um, so it's just all these nerdy like Star Wars and Lord of the Rings fans, etc., coming together and they give talks on things. The Greek Metropolitan of uh, Pittsburgh um, gave the keynote a couple of years ago, so it's like it's fully part of the church and everything. Um, uh, and so a couple of like titles from recent years: Biblical Typology and Lord of the Rings. This is one of my favorites: Thanos and Athanatos. Marvel's Avengers and the Orthodox concept of the person. Um, very interesting. It's very cool. It's very cool. So they're doing what we're saying, right? They're living out this principle, and they have as the motto of their conference um, a quote from St. Basil's uh, address to Greek men, uh, young men on the right use of Greek literature about the bee. So their motto is be the bee. So that's a kind of, yeah. How do they actually do that? This is where the title of the talk came from. Did anyone, I studied this in school, I was very lucky, but has anyone studied The Hero's Journey uh, by Joseph Campbell, the book, or uh, The Writer's Journey, which is like the TV version of it? Um, so yeah, this was an elective in English a long time ago. The basic idea in that book is every story that has like been successful in our popular culture and even long before in the ancient world, almost all of them, vast majority, follow a very specific pattern. And it's something like this, right? There's roughly, you can divide it in different ways, but there's roughly six stages. Stage one, called the ordinary world, where everything is fine and normal. And then stage two is called the call to adventure. Something happens that disturbs the ordinary world. Like the bad guy comes, someone gets kidnapped, someone dies, there's a threat of some kind. Then the hero is called to go on a journey. That's the hero's journey. They have to leave the ordinary world and go out searching. Uh, then the journey culminates in a trial, which is where the hero dies or comes very, very close to death. So think of every movie you've ever watched with a hero. This is the point where, you know, like something happens and there's an explosion and then the hero looks like they're dead and like everyone's like holding him and crying over him and everything. And then stage five is the resurrection where the hero goes, <coughs> oh, wow, that was, no, I'm okay, I'm okay, right? Hopefully you can, like a bunch of scenes from lots of different movies popped into your head. No, 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 yeah, yeah, there, there are exceptions, right, yeah. And in order to be surprising, every now and then, someone will like totally blow this, uh, you know, they'll subvert your expectations. But this is still the sort of the usual pattern. Um, and then there's the return where everything is kind of, like the problem is now fixed and so on. So obviously, this should sound familiar, right? You can very easily see how this is, the Christian story also fits with this, uh, this model. What's the ordinary world? Just yell it out to me quickly. In the Christian version of this story, what is the status quo at the beginning where everything's good? Well, yeah, just before the fallen world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The call to adventure would be the fall, right? So God makes a perfect world that's nice and everything. Or you could, do, yeah, Eden. Yeah, yeah. I suppose you could do. You could do what you're saying too. Yeah, yeah. Call to adventure is the hero leaves his home, goes on a journey. What's that? Who's the hero of the Christians? Baba Yasur. Where does he leave? He incarnates. He leaves his home. He goes on a journey. Uh, what's the trial? Cruci crucif well, yeah, Judas, crucifixion, etc. right? Um, what's the resurrection? It's a hard one. Where is that in Jesus' story? It's the resurrection. Yeah. And then there's the return, which is, you know, the end of the story. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So, point is, you can see that in, if we had more time, I'd get you to, like, pick your favorite movie or TV show. You could probably find all of those stages in there. Unless it's really edgy and they're trying to like, you know. Um. Yeah, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I feel like, yeah, we don't have time to do this. Absolutely. She uses the hero's journey very, very closely. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay, I feel like I should stop because um, time. All right, I'll see if I can just summarize this in three minutes. Just one example of how this actually works. How many of you have seen the Harry Potter movies or read the books? Just put your hand up. Okay, if you haven't, I strongly recommend them um, because they are very, very, there is a, like, they are one of the best examples of this kind of hero's journey story kind of smuggled into it. True, true. Narnia, I feel, is too obvious, like very debatable, very, oh, pfft. Listen to, listen to, yeah, freaking well said, Rose. Okay, let me just give you a quick example. I'm drawing from a few people. One way to think about Harry Potter is that the whole story is about two perspectives on death fighting each other. And they're summed up in this verse. 
which Jesus says, whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. There's two attitudes, right? One is, I want to live, so I'm going to do whatever it takes, even if I have to hurt other people, in order to preserve my life. That's the war that every one of us, like that instinct is something we all have in us, right? That's what sin is. That's the flesh. It's the selfish part of us. The opposite part, the part that we're trying to cultivate and make grow is the Christ-like part, which says my life is not my own. I will lay it down out of love for God and out of love for my neighbor. I won't seek my own. And so I won't harm anyone else just in order to preserve my own life. And this is the whole thing. All of us have both sides of us within ourselves. And you can see the whole story of Christianity as those two principles fighting it out like within each person and within humanity. So Voldemort, if you think about it, everything that he does is focused on the attitude of fear of death. The one thing that he fears uh, is death. Uh, Dumbledore actually says this to him outright. In the, it's a lot clearer in the books than in the, in the movies. Voldemort says there's nothing worse than death. And Dumbledore, speaking lightly as though they were discussing the matter over drinks, says, indeed, your failure to understand that there are things much worse than death has always been your greatest weakness. The way that you can see that is, like a little bit of spoilers, but how does Voldemort prolong his life? Like in Harry Potter, he's like 100 and something years old by this, or he's, I don't know, he's like 80 years old. Oh, right, it's, yeah, it's a bit spoilers, but you're like 20 years late now if you haven't read it, so no, no spoiler warnings anymore. What do you have to do in order to produce a Horcrux that preserves your life? You have to kill, right? So he's the embodiment of the philosophy that whatever I have to do to preserve my own life, I will do. What's his sect called? He, the people who follow him. Death eaters, right? They're all about death. They're people who, they eat death, right? Death doesn't touch them like it touches other people. And it's all built in other ways on consuming the life of others. When they take over the Ministry of Magic, like, you know, their, their whole program is to make the muggles a slave race and presumably make tons of Horcruxes so they can all be immortal and, like, other people suffer and they get to kind of profit off of that. That's the essence of selfishness and sin and the flesh and so on. The contrast to that is embodied not just in Voldemort but in lots of different characters. If you think, how many characters willingly lay down their lives in Harry Potter? Harry does it several times, one very important time at the end, but a lot of the, the, the very beginning of the story, so like hopefully you all are familiar with this, but you know Harry's got the scar because Voldemort came and tried to kill him when he was a kid and something happened. Does anyone know? How does, how does Harry survive the initial fight with Voldemort when he tries to kill him as a baby? Love, the power of love. Who's love? So his mum throws himself in between like the magical bullet and Harry and her sacrifice cast this kind of magical spell over Harry so that the spell actually rebounds and kills uh, Voldemort. So you've got one person who's willing to kill to preserve his life. The other person doesn't resist. She lets herself be killed and then somehow, in a way that he was totally not expecting, the effect of her sacrifice explodes back and kills the other guy. It's sort of a temporary death so that the book can happen but it's still kind of, it destroys him even though she wasn't doing anything hostile to him. Does that sound familiar? Who else, by not resisting, destroys a whole powerful enemy? Um, and it's so powerful, the effect of her love, that you know in the first movie, they show it well, where Voldemort's living on the back of Quirrell's head. Remember how Harry kills Quirrell? He touches him, and Quirrell kind of like burns up and the whole thing disintegrates. Um, in the book, they explain it in a bit more detail. Uh, your mother died to save you. If there's one thing Voldemort cannot understand, it is love. To have been loved so deeply, even though the person who loved us is gone, will give us some protection forever. It is in your very squint, skin. Quirrell, full of hatred, greed, and ambition, sharing his soul with Voldemort, could not touch you for this reason. It was agony to touch a person marked by something so good. It's really beautiful. And in a way, that's exactly what we have with Christ, right? Christ did that for us. And that's kind of the idea of, you know, chrismation and communion. The devil can't touch you because his love kind of shrouds you. It burns him to touch someone who has been loved so, so deeply. And then, yeah, Harry does the same thing. And this is kind of, yeah, it's explicitly built up in the story because Harry is the boy who lived. And yet, as Voldemort says, he comes to die, right? He lays down his life at the very end. And then there's a whole, like a literal death and a resurrection 
and so on. So that's just one example of how you can see, even in Harry Potter, which is not trying to be a Christian story, you still have uh, the story of Christ kind of playing on the screen. All right. All right. I think I'll stop. Any, yeah. Any questions? I don't think we have time. Question? Thank you, Sam. Okay. <clears throat> so there's a lot for, to swallow there, and there's a lot for you to ponder on how to progress in the journey of life and interactions with society and the world around you. Um, while you're doing that, which is very important and required, you also have to be anchored. So you, you as Sam was sharing earlier, the idea of discernment is really, really important. So we've got to be anchored in truth. So we don't, we're not um, betrayed by our own uh, hearts and minds that we have an anchor. So um, one of those fathers that is really anchored in truth and conquered and is an excellent example for young people is Sir Moses the Strong, or also known as Sir Moses the Black, um, not, not by any discrimination whatsoever, and I don't want you to ever think that way, because the colors of humans are never um, in any way, shape, or form indicating anything that is uh, bad or not right. Um, it, he's, he has many names, right? So St. So Moses, um, and in fact, if you go to St. Anthony's Monastery, shh, you go to St. Anthony's Monastery, you will see the different icons that are in old walls, and, and um, you would see that there are people who are martyred, their heads were cut off, and when they repainted back onto the icon, their body's complete. But Moses was left with this color to identify that the color has nothing, to, nothing shameful in it. We're all human beings with different gifts and, and uh, different diverse ways of presenting humanity, besides the LGBTQ stuff. No, I'm not talking about that. Um, so we are all uh, beautiful in the eyes of the Lord. So he is an incredibly important saint in the body of the church. And if you turn around behind you, as you're walking outside the church, you'll find his icon right up above the door there. So it's something that is something that for us to always remember. Now, very briefly, shh, very briefly, St. St. Moses was uh, a pagan that had very confused life, didn't know where to go, didn't know where the truth is. And a little tiny boy was walking past, and he was one day standing and looking at the sun and said, if you are God, tell me, show me the way. So this little kid said to him, if you want the truth, if you want God, go to the monks in the monastery and they will tell you. So off he goes with his sword, and when he gets there, the monks are saying to him, you can't come in with your sword. And they were very afraid of him because he was a gangster, a rapist, a murderer, a thief, he was an excessively uh, problematic human being. Some are very long story short, he lived an incredible repentful life. I'll tell you one quick thing, because we're very, very late. So, so Isidore, um, um, uh, because he would eat one karuf per day, one, one lamb per day. So he had to train him to not eat that much. It's problematic for the finance of the monastery, and it's also not good for him as a human being and a monk. Right? So how to make him reduce his appetite from one karuf, one lamb, per day to something little. He got him a piece of a trunk of a tree that weighs the same as a haruf, as a lamb, all right? Tells him, I want you every day, as much as this weighs, the trunk of the tree that you would eat. And as it evaporated the water out of it, it became lighter and lighter and lighter. He reduced his food slower and slower and slower. And any, many, many beautiful long stories. But today's is his feast. And we're going to say a small pray, um, praise kida, that we, uh, uh, tamgid, uh, asking him to pray for us. Also, on this day, very quickly, um, yeah, yeah. Also, next this day as well is the departure of Abu Namin and Amatullah, this father here. So this priest is the one for you. You weren't born yet. For Father Mina's, you were, you're old. <laughs> yes, he was a soldier in the army. Um, so he was the one that established this parish here um, back in 1980, 80, 80, 81, 80, 81, I think it was, yeah. Um, and uh, he departed in 2001. 
So he's the first Coptic Orthodox priest in Australia. Um, and he came eventually to this parish and established it with other laymen and built this place. And he's the nephew of Pope Carlos VI as well, the saint. Um, so he came here, established this place, and his body is in front of St. Stephen's Church. We actually relocated his body from the tomb to here. So his body is actually here. He won an Order of Australia medal from the Queen. Um, he lived a life where he sacrificed himself for God. So it's, again, that's a beautiful story. So he also departed on this day. So his prayers with us as well. Um, and we just want to tell you quickly that next week is going to be a debate. Correct? And uh, Philo, can you at the end, so we just, do you want to do it now or after? Uh, just want to do it now they run away. I have to go somewhere. Yeah. So, come on. One more Hi, everyone. Um, so, next week we have a debate. So, last week we, okay. So, last week we'd finished a series. Today we had a talk. Next week we're going to have a debate. And then the, the week after, we're going to start another series. So this is sort of like a, like a break in between. Uh, the topic is Christianity is fundamentally socialist. What does socialist mean? So it is like all about... All right, okay. Do you guys want to, like a small explanation or... Okay. So there's this idea that in Christianity, we are supposed to give everything that we have and share all our possessions, which is very similar to socialism slash communism, where everything is distributed equally. But at the same time in Christianity, you are supposed to reap what you sow, which is very, uh, very much a capitalist concept where you work for what you earn. Now, you've got two sides of the argument. The good thing about this debate is that there's no right answer. Well, there's no like definitive, like it's debate. You think there is, other people think otherwise, okay? So it's a debate um, and we need six volunteers. There are gonna be three for each side, so three for the affirmative and then three for the... All right, we've got Jerome for one. He's gonna argue that it is socialist. Yes, you are. Try the other side. All right, uh, Maria Stefanos, I know you're one because you are the one who gave us the idea for a debate. So I got two, I need four more. Don't be shy or I'm gonna have to start picking out people. Ah, oh, Justina, yep, all right. No, no, that's fine. God will give you the strength to come. You're actually sick, so you know that you're sick for next week. All right, I've got three, I need three more. She's a prophet. <laughs> Come on, guys. I'm going to start picking people randomly. Sandy? Oh, yeah. We actually need... Yeah. All right. Tony. Yeah. Tony, you're a law student. This is your alley. Yep. Marcus, come in. All right. Marcus, you've been nominated by your friends. Mina? Okay. So... So far, I've got Jerome and Tony for the males, and I've got um, Justina and Maria for the girls. I need one more boy, one more girl. <laughs> no, maybe we'll like hold off from Mirna for now. Come on, guys. Yeah, I can be biased, all right? Like Sam said, there's always going to be bias. Uh, come on, guys. No, 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 we're going to settle this now because I don't want to chase people up. All right, who did you say, Abuna? You said Mina? All right, Mina, Kiriakos, between the two of you, choose. Ilaria? All right, Ilaria, you've been nominated. All right, she's got to do food. If we're taking Justina, then she has to do food. So which one, boys? Come on, quick. All right, Kyriakos, you're going to do it. All right. So we need one more girl. Come on. Come on, guys. There's Marianne and there's Philip, apparently. Who? Who? Marianne. There's two characters now, all right? Human beings, actually. Sorry. Marianne and Philip. 
Philip, put your hand up, please. Philip. Philip, put your hand up. There's another Philip, put your hand up. No, it's not that. Another one. Oh, enter. Yeah, put your hand up. Put your hand up. Yeah, you. Okay, Philip. And then there's uh, Marianne as well, apparently. For Marianne. Where's Marianne? Marianne. We can't see. Is she hiding? Who? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Marianne? All right. Done. So it's... Philo? Yeah. Philo Marianne. All right. Philo Marianne. All right. All right. Let's pray. Yeah, let's pray. Let's go. All right. So please, I want, if you can, join in. Don't, don't just be silent. It's very easy. It's for done. In the church of the firstborn, in the pure assembly, living in all piety, the strong of our Moses. He was an idol worshiper, a highway robber. He inquired about the judge, the strong of our Moses. Moses was a barbarian, his life was full of sin. He yearned to be purified, the strong of Moses, a thief, murderer, and adulterer, lover of this passing world, the strong of Moses. Moses, the thirsty, he heard of the, the fathers, the monks, the dwellers of Shehi, the strong of Moses. He asked, Is there a God great and awesome? My heart yearns for him, the strong of Moses. Of Isidore answered, A God is strong and holy, all his bow to him, the strong of Moses. Our God is merciful, he took the form of man. Through his love he accepted shame, the strong of Moses. Our God's promise is faithful, he accepts all the repentant and loves the humble people, the strong of Moses. Give your life to him, abandon your past with him, with his grace repent to him, the strong of Moses. Moses stood and said, Receive me like a lost son, help me to repent now, the strong of Moses. He is here, ears and joy with groaning and delight, he repented of his past, the strong he appeared Christ with love, had broken and wounded, he wished to gain rest, the strong of Moses. He offered a true repentance, openly without return, revealing all his saints, the strong of Moses. Lo, the angel led. Wipe away his black skin, the tablet became pure, pure white, the strong of Moses. Of a Macarius witness that his Lord forgave and saved him, a new life was granted to him, the strong of Moses. He received the first mystery by water, spirit, and fire, removing the all his impurities, the be glory of uh, Moses. Hey, 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 hey. Hey. Hey, hey.
Oh. Uh-huh. 